All right, and so in this video, we're going to cover um, political machines and political bosses, okay? This is an example of a political boss. His name is William Boss Tweed, most commonly known as Boss Tweed, okay? What a political machine does is it's going to use corruption and uh, intimidation and things like that to achieve power over an area. Now, just because you're elected, let's say you're elected mayor through a political machine, that doesn't mean you are the boss of the of the party, the the political bosses. And so he's going to use his influence to get you elected, and you'll benefit from it too. But um, the way this is done is perfectly um, explained in this video. Um, so we're going to check it out really quick um, so you can understand it. Okay, the very important um, part that you need to understand for the test. In 1870, as newspaper editors and indignant reformers began questioning where Tweed's lavish lifestyle came from, all eyes turned to the still unfinished county courthouse on Chambers Street, a special project of Tweed's. Begun in 1858, it was supposed to have cost $350,000. Twelve years later, the price tag had reached $13 million and kept right on rising. Somewhere on this one building, which is actually quite a nice building, um, wound up costing more than the entire Houses of Parliament. Uh, well, you know, the deal is straightforward. You, we want to buy a lot of chairs. How much does that chair cost? Uh, let's say $5. Now, says Tweet, you don't mean $5. You mean $50. Oh, I do? All right. And, you know, give me the chair, $50, you know, 20 back for you, and so forth. Even the most worldly New Yorkers knew that something had to be done. People begin to tire of holding their noses, George Templeton Strong wrote and are looking about in a helpless way for some remedy. No caliph, Khan, or Caesar has risen to power or opulence more rapidly than Tweed the first. Ten years... Okay, so this guy Thomas Nast is um, a journalist. I want to say he also draws political cartoons. And so he's, what he just said, he said no caliph or Khan or um, Caesar had, had ever rose to... Power as fast as Tweed the first. So he's calling Tweed a a king. A Khan, uh, a Caesar, or a, a Caliph are kings in different types of um, de, um, cultures. Okay? And so he's calling this guy, um, you know, Boss Tweed the first. Which is typically, you would, you would call it King James the first or whatever. But anyways, that's what he's doing. Let's, let's continue. This monarch was pursuing the humble occupation of a chairmaker. He now rules the state. Now, this is Tweed, and this is, you know, the governor or whoever, the, or excuse me, or the, the mayor or, or whoever. He's behind the scenes. This guy's going to be the mayor or governor or whatever until he makes this guy mad. But this guy's always going to be the foundation of the political party, the political machine. He's the political boss. As Napoleon ruled France, there is absolutely nothing, nothing in the city which is beyond the reach of the insatiable gang who have obtained possession of it. The New York Times. In 1869, a German-born artist named Thomas Nast, with close ties to the Republican Party, began publishing a series of political cartoons in Harper's Weekly. Week after week, Nast relentlessly excoriated what he called the Tammany Hall Ring. There was Peter Brains Sweeney, the city treasurer, Mayor Abraham Oakey Hall, Tweed's puppet in City Hall. Richard Slippery Dick Conway, the Comptroller. And Boss Tweed himself, whom Nast depicted as a licentious, balding, overfed monster, literally devouring the city. I don't care a straw for newspaper articles, Tweed declared. My constituents don't know how to read, but they can't help seeing them damn pictures. He was the object of Okay, so, like, I'm not sure who's going to explain this later on in the video, but I'll explain it right now. Um, let's say that you just got here from Italy. You don't speak, um, you don't speak um, English, yada, yada, yada. But you, the, the way that the voting situation was back then, it was very easy to be corrupted and manipulated. So they would, he would say, you know, this guy, this Italian guy can't find a job. He can't speak English, um, so he can't take care of his family. Um, with all the extra money that 
Tweed would get from overpaying for things that, that he would have a lot of cash. And so here, here's um, here's 250 bucks. Get yourself um, and your family some groceries. Get him a, an apartment to start off. And um, come see me on Monday, and I'll, I'll have a job for you. Okay. And so, but the only the only catch is is you have to vote how I tell you to vote. Um, you know, from now on. And so not only could they vote once, but let's say this gentleman had a mustache or long hair. They would go and vote and then come back later with their mustache shaved. And then they'd vote again. And then they'd come back with their mustache shaved still, obviously, and their haircut. And so they vote three times. And so this is very corrupt. It's very easy to um, uh, manipulate elections back then. That's how his this power worked. But he's saying, so when he's saying, I don't care too much for newspapers because my, my constituents, my, my, my followers, whatever the people I help, they can't read anyways, even if they are American. I mean, not, we take it for granted that we can read now, but a lot of people couldn't read back then. He said, but they can't help but see those damn pictures because those pictures, people could understand something even if they can't read. Okay, and so let's move on. One of the most successful campaigns by a political cartoonist in history, Thomas Nast, really did the most extraordinary job of attacking Tweed and exposing the Tweed ring in Harper's Weekly. Those pictures will live forever. The way you can never separate Nixon from Woodward and Bernstein, you can't separate Tweed from Thomas Nast. They're wed together for the rest of history, I guess. On July 8th, 1871, the New York Times joined the fray, publishing excerpts from secret courthouse records obtained from a disgruntled city official. Tweed had cheated out of thousands of dollars in kickbacks. The figures were astonishing. Eleven thermometers had been purchased for $7,500. Dust rooms for $41,000. One contractor had been paid $5.5 million for window shades, carpets, and furniture. It would never be clear how much Tweed's corruption had been exaggerated by the press. The New York Times put the final tally at almost $200 million. But in the end, it didn't matter. New York needed a villain equal in scale to its giant park and giant bridge. And Tweed fit the bill. In part, because he simply looked the part. Okay, and so that's a pretty cool video of that. Um, and so like I said, he, he would just um, take all the money he would make from those kickbacks and use it to, you know, corrupt people and, and it would help them out. Help them out, but then in, in, in return, he asked for their vote. But anyways, that's um, p political machines in eight minutes.